Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on why and how to sign a data processing agreement with Treasurit. Today, our hosts, Istvan Lam, co-founder and CEO of Treasurit, and Petra Kovacic, Legal and Data Protection Council of Treasurit, will discuss everything you need to know about a data processing agreement and the process of executing a DPA with Treasurit. During the webinar, we are going to collect questions from our participants. You are going to see a Q&A button at the top left corner of your Zoom interface. Please post your questions here and our hosts will answer them at the end of their presentation. Istvan and Petra, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, the reason why we are here today is to give you some ideas about uh, what is a data processing agreement, why it is important for you to execute it, and uh, to discuss some practicalities as to how, it, how to sign a data processing agreement with us. Probably you have heard a lot uh, about uh, DPAs and data processing agreements in, uh, the, during the recent weeks uh, as the entry into effect of the GDPR is approaching. Uh, just to give you some background, uh, the general data protection regulation of the EU is about to come into force on this Friday, the 25th May. And uh, among others, it uh, requires data controllers to enter into data processing uh, agreements uh, with data processors. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that most of you are well aware uh, about what the GDPR is, uh, but uh, but to ensure that we are on the on a different on on the same level, uh, this is a regulation that aims to harmonize the data protection laws across the EU and also strengthen the data protection of personal data within the EEA. Next slide, please. Mm, one of the requirements of the GDPR is that data controllers must enter into data processing agreements. Why it is important? What is the rationale behind a data processing agreement? Um, as you may know, uh, the GDPR requires data controllers to implement sufficient se uh, security and technical measures in order to comply with the GDPR. Data controllers are not only required to be able to demonstrate themselves that they are compliant with the GDPR, uh, but if they uh, intend to outsource certain data uh, processing activities, then they also must be able to demonstrate that their suppliers, subprocessors, uh, are also acting in a GDPR compliant manner. The data processing agreement is a legally binding document uh, that should be entered into in writing or by electronic means, and it regulates the rights and obligations uh, of data processors. Uh, when do you need to enter into a DPA? For example, uh, if you are a controller and wish to transfer uh, your data to a third party cloud service provider, you need to sign a DPA with the cloud provider. We can jump to the next slide. Uh, we thought that uh, it would make sense to give you some basic definitions to understand correctly uh, the roles and responsibilities under the data processing agreement. Uh, basically, the GDPR uh, regulates data processing by very, very broad means and says that uh, any operations performed on personal data is considered to be data processing. For example, if you collect, store, disclose, or even delete personal data, uh, then it will be considered as data processing and as a result be subject, subject to the GDPR. Under the GDPR, you will be considered as a data controller if you are an entity who determines the purpose and means of data processing. On the other hand, a person who will process data on your behalf in accordance with your instructions, such person will be considered as a data processor. So in light of uh, these definitions, uh, probably, uh, do you need to sign a DPA? Uh, on the next slide, uh, we try to summarize uh, those 
most important points uh, that you should be aware of when you are signing the DPA. Mm, these are uh, the most important features of the DPA that ensures that your processors are in compliance with the GDPR. Uh, I believe that one of the most important questions of a data processing agreement is whether your data processor provides sufficient security and technical measures in order to provide that your data is duly protected. Under the GDPR, uh, if there is a data breach, even on the side of your data processor, you're as, you as a data controller may be held responsible for that data breach. Accordingly, it is very important uh, that first uh, you ensure that your data processor will not end up in a data breach. And if such data breach happens, then there are sufficient measures uh, to um, decrease uh, the effects of such data breach and that you will be informed sufficiently and in a timely manner so that you can uh, inform and give uh, notice to data subjects and uh, the data protection authorities. Another important uh, feature and question that you should be aware of is that uh, data processors uh, should not uh, be able to process your data for any other purposes. That is the basic uh, idea and purpose of your data processing agreement and of the outsourcing. Accordingly, you should check how will your data processors use your data that you disclose with them. Will they process data in accordance with your contract or are they authorized uh, to process data for their own purposes. Uh, on the next slide, Istvan uh, will tell you a practical example so that you understand better uh, cases where data processors may uh, use data for their own purposes. Um, so that uh, uh, in this extreme example, what we'll uh, uh, discuss that um, uh, a student uh, first goes to university and uh, a university has a legal basis for processing uh, his or her uh, data. It can be the uh, email address, uh, the name, the mail address, um, and so on. Uh, but uh, on top of that, it might be the test results, uh, which is uh, uh, associated with, with the students, how, how uh, he or she performs during uh, her studies after finishing uh, out the school. But there is a legal basis, which is not necessarily coming with the consent, but it's also uh, a legal requirements for a university to keep those data on records and store it for a couple of years. The next one, please. Uh, there is an, a company, a headhunter company, um, the student uh, finishes up, graduates at the university, and then uh, hands over uh, his or her CV to a headhunter uh, company. And the headhunter company uh, starts looking for a job uh, and starts uh, sending the CVs to relevant uh, uh, companies who would like to uh, employ uh, that student. The headhunter company uh, in this uh, case are basically reselling. Uh, the data are selling to uh, companies, but the student is aware of that, give, uh, give consent uh, uh, to that, uh, and that ca uh, gives a legal basis for, for that data processing and that data forwarding as, uh, as well. And it, it can be done on, uh, in a GDPR compliant way. Both organizations uh, can regulate their uh, um, connection and, and relationship with, with the students. And we can say that they are GDPR uh, uh, compliant. The hat hunter may use uh, uh, data processors, for instance, other hat hunters. Usually in Europe, uh, there are big hat hunter firms and they have uh, subsidiaries across different member states and they can forward the data. Um, and there is uh, 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 an agreement which regulates that how it, it is done. But the hat hunter um, is using and those other headhunters 
and other entities are using uh, the data on a similar way what the, the student gave access to. So that, uh, that can be easily um, uh, managed. So now, the next one, please. Uh, let's assume uh, that um, the university, uh, someone, uh, uh, thinks that it is a good idea that um, uh, because of unemployment rate is going up in the country and, all, uh, and things like that, and, and uh, graduate students uh, cannot find jobs uh, easily, whatever reason, there is an in initiative that the university hands over all data uh, to our headhunter. All the students' uh, 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 CVs, uh, all the backgrounds, all the test results, and the headhunter, for the purpose of uh, using uh, that to find jobs uh, for the uh, undergraduate or graduate uh, students. Um, this is, uh, let's say, the headhunter uh, uh, issue um, a DPA saying that, okay, this is, this is what I need from you, uh, uh, you need from the university, that uh, the university actually had the legal basis to process and information, and they need to state that they have the uh, um, uh, legal basis for such uh, processing. The hat hunter doesn't need to, uh, doesn't need to um, investigate whether the university truly have that right. They issue that uh, DPA, and the university signs that uh, DPA, saying that, oh yeah, yeah, this is what we want to do. But uh, the university did not update the privacy policy and uh, um, with, with the students, and didn't get consent uh, from the student, and there is no other legal basis of that data processing uh, there. We feel that it's, it's not a match, but here the problem is that the uh, university widened the scope of uh, uh, the data processing, uh, used uh, someone else and, and used for a purpose which was, there was no legal basis for, uh, uh, for, for that purpose. And that makes, an, makes it incompatible uh, with the DPA, what is uh, 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 written in the DPA. The headhunter, still can be GDPR compliant. But in this case, you know, the university is, uh, is a subject to, to a huge fine because they, they are doing something they couldn't uh, do uh, otherwise. Next one, please. So what you need to look into the DPA uh, in this uh, practical, uh, after this practical or uh, uh, extreme example that uh, uh, the, the DPA covers the measures and also the obligations you have and the limitations you have with your uh, uh, contract with the uh, uh, private in individuals, or if you are a processor and using a subprocessor, uh, that uh, you are not widening the scope of your uh, data processing. Here is an example of uh, one cloud provider. Because when you are choosing a cloud provider and you are uh, uh, trying to find out the legal basis uh, or uh, some contractual um, uh, basis for, uh, for, for their processing, this is what they are uh, they're, um, issuing and what they are uh, disclosing uh, to, uh, to their customers. I don't want to uh, name the, uh, the company. But uh, what they include in their privacy policy, and this is not a uh, DPA, this is a, a privacy policy, but in this example, there is no way to sign uh, DPA with them, um, is that they will analyze uh, and provide uh, different uh, uh, search results, advertising, uh, based on the contents you upload to them. And that contents can be, uh, for instance, uh, a document uh, containing several private information of third party individuals. And in this case, you are giving a consent you couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, give to that uh, cloud provider. Compared to, uh, or for instance, uh, uh, the PA, we give you uh, um, um, a technical and also a legal 
uh, measure and guarantee that we cannot uh, process the data, we cannot uh, get access uh, to, uh, to the encrypted content. And uh, we not just saying it's in white papers and technical, um, uh, technical documents, we also guarantee it uh, in our privacy policy and in our uh, uh, DPA as well. And this is uh, why it is important to look into uh, the rights DPA with your cloud provider, because uh, you could be the next uh, uh, one who uh, making uh, this uh, or having a data processor who who's widening the scope. Next one, please. Um, so, what we are, uh, for instance, uh, guaranteeing at Trezor is um, that, um, and what we say uh, that the, because of the we cannot access uh, the encrypted content what you upload uh, to us. That uh, this is what uh, this is achieved by doing uh, on encryption on your machine a key which is unknown to us. And because of uh, this process, when the data comes to our servers and our uh, service, um, it cannot be used to identify uh, identify any individual. And this, uh, uh, this uh, under the GDPR is not a personal uh, data from integrity and confidentiality perspective. From availability perspective, it is still uh, uh, personal data, but that if you keep a, a local uh, backup copy, uh, then, then uh, you're, you're just uh, fine. Or you need to only uh, worry about the availability of the data uh, in case of treasury if, if uh, um, if you only store the data in, in the cloud under the GDPR. Mm, so and, uh, what we, the reason why we are signing a DPA with you, the scope much more is uh, about the non-encrypted data. For instance, uh, the employees of the uh, organization, the email addresses, their names, uh, uh, and so on, which is encrypted at trust, and now I'll explain what's the difference between the end to end and the uh, at trust encryption. So we store it securely still, but our employees might or may have uh, access uh, to that. And that, uh, that is why we need to regulate uh, uh, how we, we process uh, that data. Um, and with respect to such uh, uh, very limited uh, um, amount of data, we act as a data processor because you as a company, if uh, you hand over the data of your employees, we are uh, processing it and not uh, directly contracting with, uh, have a contract with, with your employees. Uh, so our DPA uh, is, uh, uh, covers this one while uh, the, the files and, and what is uh, done there uh, or how is it stored? It is outside of the scope of uh, the DPA because it doesn't need to be covered, but it is, uh, as, uh, um, we also guarantee our terms of use in a privacy policy. So you, you get the uh, uh, contractual guarantees uh, for this end-to-end -end encryption and how we uh, store end-to-end -end encrypted uh, data. But let me jump into uh, the end-to-end -end encryption and why is it important and how does it differ from the server side or at-rest encryption and in transit encryption. Um, you can see that Alice is uploading a, a picture and it is uh, encrypted in transit. That's uh, usually done uh, SSL and TLS and that guarantees that between you and the cloud, the data is uh, encrypted and cannot be accessed, for instance, on a Wi-Fi network, an open Wi-Fi network, and uh, no one can see what is inside uh, what you're uploading to, uh, to the cloud. On the server side, uh, what happens, the data uh, is, uh, is decrypted once it arrives to uh, the server, and they may apply an additional uh, encryption with a key managed by the cloud provider um, to store it on the disks. This is stored, this is called at trust encryption uh, or disk en uh, encryption. And that uh, uh, tend to 
gives some sort of uh, secrecy measure. It's better than nothing. But uh, here you can see that this uh, the cloud provider has access uh, the contents of, of, of your files. And the other side, and when uh, the data is uh, uh, downloaded, it is encrypted again uh, and put it in, in a very secure channel, and Bob will uh, download. And you can look into the secrecy of these channels and then add trust encryption, and you will find several uh, documentations uh, about how secure they are and what type of algorithms they use. But the architectural itself uh, gives them an access uh, to your actual content, and they can view and, and scan and do whatever uh, they are uh, or they can or they uh, uh, do with with your data under the agreements, or even more if there is a uh, there is a breach or a rogue employee. The next slide, please. And um, at the same time, instant encryption or client side encryption. Um, uses uh, an architecture where the files are encrypted on the customer's machine before it leaves uh, le before, before it leaves that with a key only known uh, to the customer or to the ones who uh, the customer shares with so alice encrypts uh, with a random key that picture uploads it to the cloud but the cloud does not decrypt uh, the information doesn't even have access to the key uh, store uh, the, the data as is. And when Bob access that information, Bob downloads the encrypted information and then decrypts uh, with a key which is shared in another channel uh, uh, by Alice. This, how is it done? That this is a difference. Uh, there are many, many ways. What we're using at Trusted, for instance, is public key encryption, which uh, guarantees that only Alice and Bob can access uh, to uh, to the information i would like to hand back to, uh, uh, to petra thank you so uh as this one has already mentioned uh treasury does process certain limited amount of personal data on behalf uh, of our customers uh, and as a result, you may need to conclude a DPA uh, with us as a part of our contractual relationship. When do you need to sign a DPA with us? Uh, first, if the GDPR applies to you, and uh, this is something uh, that should be accessed, assessed uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, probably by, with the involvement uh, of a legal counsel, However, if you are a business, uh, you use Treasury uh, for business purposes, uh, you are either located uh, within the EU or uh, your employees or, or partners who you share your files with through Treasury are located uh, within the EU, it is very likely that you will be subject to the GDPR. Uh, with Treasury, uh, you can sign uh, a DPA if you have a business subscription, i.e. if you have a solo, small business, business or enterprise subscription with us. Uh, as we understand that a high percentage uh, of our customers will probably will need to sign a DPA, uh, we implemented a process whereby uh, we think that you can uh, sign uh, the DPA very easily and uh, quickly. Uh, on the next slides, uh, I will uh, give you some um, details about uh, how can you do it, do it uh, through uh, your uh, web access. Uh, as a background, uh, we have also published a detailed FAQ on our website, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, at the end of our presentation, uh, we will uh, share uh, the link with you. So if you have any questions uh, during the signing process, uh, just reach out for the FAQ, and uh, I hope that you will find the answer for your questions. Uh, first of all, in order to be able to initiate the signing process, uh, you need to be a subscription owner, uh, i.e. a person who has uh, enhanced administration rights within uh, your Treasury account. 
Uh, if you are a subscription owner, uh, then you will find uh, a tab uh, under uh, billing uh, that uh, provides you a possibility to sign a data processing agreement. Uh, by clicking here, uh, you can initiate a signing flow. Uh, the signing uh, and the execution of the DPA uh, will be done uh, by docu through a DocuSign process and uh, you will uh, receive an email from them, mm, them where and up, upwards uh, you need to follow um, the instructions uh, of the email. Uh, we also thought about cases uh, where the subscription owner is not someone who is uh, entitled to sign on behalf of the company. Uh, it must be pointed out that uh, only the authorized uh, signatories uh, of your company uh, should execute the DPA so that it will be legally uh, valid and binding. In such case, uh, you as a subscription owner uh, will receive the DPA and you will have the chance uh, to review it, uh, but you will also have a possibility to reassign uh, the DPA to someone else who has the signatory rights on your company's behalf. Uh, on, the, on the next slide, uh, you can see uh, the following steps uh, that, that you should go through, through DocuSign. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward and uh, hopefully uh, you will uh, be able to successfully sign uh, your DPA uh, with us. Uh, next slide, please. Once uh, your DPA is successfully signed, it will become a legally binding document between your company and Treasury, and uh, it will be treated as an addendum of our terms of use. After you have executed the document, uh, going forward, uh, you will be able uh, to reach it anytime uh, through uh, your account and uh, also you will be able to uh, save it for your files or if you wish, uh, you can uh, reach it uh, afterwards uh, from your treasury account. Um. Now that, that we should answer a few uh, 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 questions, if you have any uh, uh, questions related to uh, this presentation, also uh, uh, the the process itself, and uh, or or any other uh, um, related question to to this topic. I have a few uh, questions, but if uh, if you would like to post a, a question, please uh, feel free to click on the Q&A button and, uh, um, and open a, a question. So uh, Ludovic uh, asks, uh, how is it managed? Uh, how is it managed data collected, connection time, ID, and so on related to third parties to whom I give access to share a treasury folder? Thank you. Um, Petra, uh, can you uh, give a, a few, or can you just, uh, um, explain uh, how we are uh, controllers and also processors and how this in relation when the sharing happens, how is it uh, uh, treated and how is it viewed from a legal perspective? Sure. So I think uh, that uh, the data that you are referring to uh, is exactly uh, the data that is uh, on your behalf and that falls within the scope uh, of the uh, DPA. Uh, for example, uh, the name uh, and the email address uh, of employees or even third parties, uh, if they are given access uh, to your shared treasury folders, uh, are personal data. And this is something uh, that uh, we also have access to. Uh, also, um, any particularities relating to whether somebody has uh, edited or deleted uh, a certain folder, uh, if they have any rights uh, to access a certain folder, 
these are details that are covered by uh, our DPA. It is important that in such cases, uh, you are considered uh, as a data controller or perhaps a, a data processor. Uh, and and uh, in such cases, uh, the sufficient legal basis uh, for the processing uh, should be covered by the legal relationship uh, between you uh, and the relevant uh, individuals. Uh, but at the same time, there are, uh, um, there are users who are not, uh, uh, not, not necessarily part of the business uh, accounts. And that uh, how how do we uh, view those uh, users? For instance, a completely third party uh, uh, Ludovic, for instance, share uh, with um, with a link. Uh, how uh, what what's your view on that? Uh, certain certain data is also covered by uh, our DPA. However, uh, we have also published our uh, privacy policy uh, on our website so that third parties are sufficiently uh, informed uh, about the, the data processed uh, within Tresgerit uh, if they have access to it. Hope uh, that uh, answers Ludovic uh, uh, your question. Uh, and there is a, another question from Ludovic. Do you have a sample text to use with our own clients who own the data we upload encrypted to Treasury to disclose Treasury encryption and how this protects uh, them from data processing? Uh, we have not yet uh, published uh, such text. Uh, of course, uh, you uh, can uh, read our privacy policy uh, on our website. I, I think it is uh, important to highlight uh, that uh, uh, when you have some obligation to a third party, usually it's much broader than uh, what we require. Uh, so that uh, storing information in an encrypted form that that third party, in this case Trezor, doesn't have access, usually covered by the uh, by your standards uh, clauses anyway. And this is why we uh, uh, highlight that we ask for very small um, set of or, or very small access uh, to the information which most probably uh, compatible with any of any uh, standard clauses uh, what the businesses are using what's your view on this Petra mm, yes I, I see your point Ishvan, and uh, uh, I, I wanted to confirm that probably mm, uh, consent is not only the not the only legal basis that you can rely on in in, in such cases. So probably uh, your re legal relationship, for example, with your employees, uh, gives a legal basis by default. But this is something that uh, should be accessed on a case by case basis. Hope we uh, answered your uh, question, Ludwig. Um, Anonymous attendee asked, uh, are we protected against data breaches if we use Treasury for sharing files with our partners? Well, we have a, uh, another webinar uh, uh, much more detailed about the uh, data breaches and, and, and we cover the case of the data breach itself uh, and also what is um, how need to be uh, viewed if, for instance, encrypted content uh, um, is is breached. Briefly about that presentation, but I uh, uh, encourage you to uh, view that. Uh, briefly, uh, basically, when the data is, for instance, leaked out, an encrypted content leaked out, in that case, uh, you don't even need to make a breach notification if the, your problem relates or could be the integrity or the confidentiality because those two, the integrity of the data and the confidentiality of the data, encryption guarantees that uh, it is not breached unless your system uh, is breached. If our system uh, is breached and we leak out information, you don't need to view that as a breach of uh, private information. 
However, if someone hacks us and deletes all the data, and then uh, you need to, uh, you have a um, obligation to uh, to uh, keep that data so that the availability uh, of the data is breached. That's a different uh, manner. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's something. I mean, uh, the encryption doesn't solve all the problems, but most importantly, usually when it comes to breach, usually we're talking about uh, the confidentiality, so it leaks out, not it's, it's being deleted, but it uh, also need to uh, need to highlight that the availability can be breached, and in certain cases, that uh, losing that data can cause some GDPR-related problems. But I. Uh, ask Petra to uh, briefly cover from legal uh, perspective as well, if, uh, a few words. Uh, I, I totally understand uh, and I totally agree with your point. Uh, and I think we have one question relating to the, uh, to the signing process. I think that that seems to be quite important that asks that whether users are meant uh, are required to complete the annex to make the agreement binding uh and and i and think it's important to point out that the signing process uh provided through our application uh makes it easy to sign the dpa uh because these uh you will receive a pre-signed document uh from us that is already completed so that you do not have to uh, add your uh, details there. Your company details will already uh, be uh, there. But uh, one thing you need to make sure that you check uh, those details uh, and uh, do not sign unless uh, you are fine with the details inside. Uh, if not, uh, please uh, contact our support and, and uh, we should be able to amend those details. Hopefully we could cover uh, your question. Um, Jasper asks, uh, do you need double or uh, and extra level encryption to uh, be covered by GDPR compliance or is it Trezor uh, is secur security sufficient? Um, the extra level of encryption there are many algorithms and many level of encryption and it the short answer is it depends the a little bit more detailed the uh, that the treasury secrecy is quite uh, sufficient and it uh, gives uh, uh, a secrecy measure we provide security measure which is above the industry uh, standard so it should be fine, and it is uh, fine GDPR uh, compliance uh, perspective. But uh, I need to highlight that GDPR compliance is not just about you know how you store your information at the cloud provider, and how the, your cloud provider stores that. If you your employee, for instance, post it uh, on Facebook and uh, disclose everything, even if it was uh, stored uh, and encrypted in in Trezoret, it doesn't help you so that it will uh, you will have something or for instance you uh, uh, you share with someone in if you are uh, just going back to the uh, university example you are the university and you are sharing with a headhunter through treasure it it doesn't help you at all so uh, uh, the uh, encryption provides in uh, 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 for the confidentiality once it's stored and how is it uh, stored, but there are other areas. But for that purpose, uh, the storing purpose, just the zooming in, um, what we are using uh, encryption is quite strong. Uh, those are the industry standards and the, uh, these are the um, latest algorithms uh, recommended by different uh, standardization bodies. And that should be uh, fine from a uh, GDPR perspective. Anything to add, uh, Petra? Okay, um, nothing from Petra, so we can go on. Uh, John, John, uh, and I cannot pronounce, sorry for uh, my bad pronunciation, but here's another question. If I am a data processor, do I have to sign a DPA with uh, all of my sub-processors? 
over to you. Uh, yes, yes, this is a very good question. Uh, even if you are not a, com a controller, uh, but you are uh, a processor because you process data on somebody else's behalf, nevertheless, if you outsource your activities uh, to someone else, you will need to uh, sign a DPA with them and ensure that uh, any other subprocessors within the contractual chain uh, complies uh, with the requirements of the GDPR. Uh, this is something that is important to point to be pointed out because uh, previously under some national legislation uh, it was not uh, possible to involve subprocessors and I believe that in this way uh, the GDPR makes the process a bit uh, more uh, clear and uh, easier. Thank you. Um, I hope it answered your uh, question. The next one from Jasper. I have not yet entered the double end system as I am now aware of the impacts with two systems. I'm not sure if I understand uh, 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 this uh, question. If uh, Jasper, please uh, could you, uh, or later on you, you uh, give some more details of your uh, uh, question that would be uh, good and we get back to this. An anonymous uh, question, uh, I did, didn't quite follow the parts about the difference in GDPR if you are using Trezor as a uh, cloud only as opposed to having a local backup. So that, uh, um, the local uh, backup, uh, in that case you're not having any data processor or uh, someone who's doing it for you then you need to make sure uh, that uh, uh, your your technical measures are fine and you have the uh, uh, proper uh, uh, data centers where you lock it down you have a proper monitoring uh, um, also that the uh, the softwares the server softwares are uh, in place and so on and so on and so on you don't need to sign a DPA with anyone, that's true, uh, but um, uh, you still have obligations to uh, meet with the uh, 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 GDPR requirements. So that uh, um, the difference uh, in, in this case that you are pointing a third party to process your data as a business, you, you are um, using for instance uh, Trezorith as a, a third party uh, and that's why you need to somehow make sure that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, relationship is covered in in um, somehow how, how uh, what is the obligation of Trezorith what should we follow what uh, we cannot do for you and so on and so on and that is uh, uh, written down in an agreement called DPA and uh, the, also the terms of use and, and the privacy policy when we act as a controller. So these are the written uh, rules between our relationship, but uh, when you are doing it in-house, in that's your choice. Uh, in that, that case, you uh, don't necessarily need to have these documents in, in place, but you need to introduce processor processes and uh, several measures, uh, technical and uh, organizational measures. Uh, which guarantees that your uh, local data backup will not be breached. Anything to add, Petra? Nothing from my side. I think that... Uh... Another question. Are users meant to complete an annex to make the agreement binding? I, I think this is a question that we have uh, already covered. Uh, so I think uh, we can we can move on uh, to the next one. Uh, somebody is asking what policies do we recommend uh, to set up in our admin center? Um, yeah, um, this is uh, purely. I mean, the, uh, you can be quite trust uh, be quite restrictive, and the policies help you to. Uh, regulate your uh, organization. If you don't limit 
then you need to rely on the people how they use and they uh, do it uh, uh, on a way that they are following the regulations of GDPR. These are not this, these policies again. These are not silver bullets. So that, for instance, not using a, a mobile device or uh, you can set up uh, IP IP uh, limitations so that uh, people can, will not able to access the trust grid outside of your office. These are heuristic measures to uh, protect your information. If you find that uh, people better not to use data outside of your organization, it is important. In several cases, it is. Um, then do that. But in other cases, it is completely fine uh, to work from home. Uh, and then you can uh, just enable uh, that. What we encourage, uh, for instance, using two-factor authentication and enforce two-factor authentication, for instance. Um, and also what we uh, uh, suggest that if, if uh, you want to make sure that no one uh, can create a trezor which is unknown to the administrator, just uh, disable uh, the uh, capability as a policy to create a trezor, a shared folder, because in that case, that uh, folder uh, will, uh, will not be seen by the administrator uh, as, a, as a user. While if you disable and the administrator creates all the shared folders uh, inside Trezor, you have a better control. But again, it depends on, 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 on how, how you operate, uh, what are the things you uh, think it is uh, important for, for you. And one thing I, uh, I, I would like to add from a GDPR perspective is that, uh, you know, besides uh, uh, concluding a contract with a supplier that provides uh, the necessary security and technical measures, also using uh, the features that uh, Istvan has just already mentioned, uh, can be a very uh, good proof that you are indeed implementing the necessary technical and organizational uh, measures uh, that are required under the GDPR. So this can serve as an additional guarantee to your GDPR compliance. There is a question from Florian. Why do you think the encrypted personal, uh, personal data is not covered by the GDPR? The tool provided by Trezoret does the encryption. Although it is done locally, in case of the encryption process, uh, has some secrecy issues, the personal data might still get compromised. True, it's a, uh, a valid point, but in this case, we are not, our, as an organization, we're not uh, uh, doing or having access to the data. As an organization, we are providing you a software which is supposed to do certain things. And uh, for instance, if you have a local a system like your laptop and you have Windows or other operating system, and if had, that has a bug, then uh, you still have a problem um, as, as well. So, and that is not, uh, uh, so Windows, in case of Windows, Microsoft is not a data processor, even though they are providing uh, the operating system, the very basic uh, uh, software for, for uh, the computer. Um, they have other obligations coming from, you know, the, providing the, uh, the software that is covered in the software license uh, agreements, which is in a uh, case of Trezor, that is part of terms of use. And the, uh, uh, the terms of use uh, uh, has a part of uh, software license and, and that uh, regulates this, uh, this uh, relationship as well. But maybe uh, Petra, you can explain better than I. I. Yes, as uh, we have already mentioned, uh, the, your, your files are totally unreadable uh, for Trezorit. So uh, I think what is important here is that uh, we cannot have uh, access uh, to the personal data. And yeah, as as uh, as uh, Istvan has uh, described and and uh, elaborated on during the presentation. 
and it is important to uh, also add that uh, uh, it is an amendment to uh, the, uh, to the, the terms of use which regulates our relationship regarding to uh, to the data and if it comes let's say uh, we don't encrypt uh, properly and that encrypted content uh, is um, uh, can you know we receive an unencrypted so an encrypt which should be encrypted uh, otherwise but we receive an information uh, then the dpa is uh, uh, covers covers uh, that that part because then it it becomes uh, 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 PII for uh, Trezor. Hopefully, uh, I could uh, answer your question, Florian. Uh, let's move on. Uh, an anonymous uh, user. Is Trezor the data processor of the files we upload? I think we have just covered this question. Yeah, uh, we are a data processor but if it's encrypted then it it is not in the same universe so, so it is not in the gdpr uh, universe but that if it was in the gdpr universe yes uh, uh, can we get access to the slides uh, i think uh, we will upload it to the uh, uh, to the website you can see treasure it www.treasure.com slash gdpr you you can uh, you will upload this presentation uh, the recording and also the slides also the previous presentations uh, we had in this topic and jasper uh, is the double encryption step you can load uh, or not load in the system as uh, for storage it should not be should not be needed as you say i'm not sure if i uh, understand uh, uh, but l later you you cover that let me leave it open here uh, again and then i'll come back uh, ludovic uh, since data is encrypted uh, do we need to inform our local data protection administration if there is a breach on the uh, treasury side? Although I hope very unlikely. Thank you. Uh, we had a, um, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned in uh, previous uh, uh, answering a previous question, we had a, 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 a webinar, a full webinar about that. If you, again, if uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the availability is not breached, then you don't need to. It relates it to the uh, the encrypted content. While uh, if, if, for instance, uh, the uh, pri uh, private information, for instance, the email addresses of, of your employees under the uh, business subscription, that is uh, something you will need to do as a notification. Treasury has a uh, um, obligation to notify you uh, it is covered in the dpa and then you will hand over to uh, uh, you will need to hand over to the uh, local data protection uh, authorities yes. do you want to uh, um, under the gdpr you are required uh, to notify authorities uh, or in certain cases data subjects uh, when there is a breach that can that could uh, end up in uh, risk uh, for the privacy uh, of data subjects. Uh, so, as Istvan uh, has said, uh, in a case uh, where somebody has access to your encrypted data, uh, i.e., to data that is in a totally unreadable uh, format, it is very unlikely that uh, such breach if we even can call it a breach, uh, would result in serious risk uh, for the data subjects of privacy. There is another question. Uh, could you sum up uh, in a few sentences why should I should choose to reserve over Dropbox or OneDrive? Uh, to specifically to Dropbox and, and uh, uh, OneDrive. Um, what is uh, important is that uh, uh, those one Dropbox and OneDrive, they are not having end-to-end -end encryption in place. They are having uh, uh, um, uh, in, in transit and at rest encryption. 
what I showed you that they decrypt the information when they receive the information, uh, they store, uh, they can analyze, um, and then maybe uh, as a disk encryption, they uh, encrypt it again, but they have access to the keys. We don't have access to the keys, which uh, with we can uh, decrypt any information. And that's the main difference um, of the two, uh, uh, two systems. Uh, the other uh, system, we are a European provider. Uh, uh, that's uh, that makes uh, certain regulations and uh, local regulations easier uh, in uh, data pro uh, processing. Those can be the the two uh, points, you know, for a few sentences. Um, I uh, I think we are running out of. Uh, uh, time uh, uh, not to uh, there is a, a, a time for a last uh, question for Jasper to try to explain there are multiple questions uh, from you uh, so what we are uh, doing that uh, you ask uh, the two factor the two factor is that you are authenticated as a user in two ways with a password and some something else for instance on a phone number so that we send a text message with double encryption uh, uh, which is not necessarily uh, uh, i don't exactly know what you mean by uh, double encryption but uh, there are different uh, encryptions uh, for instance it can happen on your machine uh, that is a for instance encrypting your disk in case of iphone uh, that's why FBI couldn't access the pictures. Um, that was uh, an Apple versus FBI case because the data locally on that phone was encrypted. This is the local uh, uh, encryption, which is a little bit different what we're uh, doing. We're doing that we are encrypting, then transferring it to the cloud. Uh, and that's uh, that. the two things. I mean, the encryption happens at the same device. But that uh, uh, in case of the local encryption or disk encryption, the data stays on your device. In our case, the data travels travels to the cloud and then uh, it is stored uh, in an encrypted uh, form. What I give you as an example that uh, uh, was that uh, in transit, the, the server-side encryption, which is used by others, not by Trezorate. The in-transit encryption, it is uh, just for the connection, it is encrypted, not on the way to the other user, just between you and the cloud. And then there is a second encryption, which is completely uh, uh, independent from this channel encryption, which is stores uh, uh, locally, or stores to the, the, the storage systems of the cloud provider. This is not double encryption because it is not applied on the encrypted, what is encrypted in, inside the information. It is independent. They decrypt the information and then re-encrypt uh, for, for that. And this is, for instance, uh, related to, uh, to the, another question was uh, about uh, uh, OneDrive and, uh, and Dropbox. They are doing this, that they take out the clear text data they do something uh, with that and then encrypt, maybe encrypt uh, while they're storing it uh, in their system. Um, very, very last uh, question from Ludovic. So the weakest link uh, is our password or access policy treasury. Any recommendation? Uh, what I recommend with uh, strong password, that's important. Uh, but uh, uh, on top of that, use two-factor authentication uh, so that uh, even if the password is compromised and there is another uh, way that uh, third parties will not be able to access. Uh, but important, uh, when you use Trezorate, uh, we just uh, free up your mind when it comes to the secrecy of the cloud provider. But we, uh, so that will be a simple, a simple thing. You don't need to care about that and look deep into how we are processing information because you can, you know, that stays in, inside your organization. The compliance of your organization is your responsibility. And that's what you need to uh, 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 look into. But what we are uh, giving you 
it's just easing up when it's here uh, uh, so you can you can focus on your organization and make things happen so people are not uh, doing uh, cr crazy stuff and it's it can be policies it can be uh, education it can be uh, other ways it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, a strict policy it can be that you sit down with everyone and explain how to use information and what to uh, do with that um, so there is multiple uh, ways to uh, use that. Um, that was all for for today. Uh, thank you uh, all participating uh, today, and uh, we'll keep you posted if there is uh, anything, uh, um, uh, um, any any further uh, webinars and any further uh, content. Hope you uh, f uh, found this uh, useful, and hope you uh, will. Uh, execute or DPA easily as uh, Ben mentioned. Thank you for. Uh, Thank you very much.